Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to my review of Night of Knives, a novel of the Malazan Empire by Ian C. Esselmont. For those unaware, Stephen Erickson and Ian Esselmont created the world of Malazan together, but it wasn't until Stephen Erickson started publishing his Malazan Book of the Fallen and it became successful that Ian Esselmont was also published. Now, as opposed to my Book of the Fallen review, which is coming and will cover the entire series at once, I figured I'd do a series of short reviews for Esselmont and give my impressions as I get through each book of his six-part series. I will say before I start that there will be some comparisons to Steven Erickson's works, and while they focus on different things, they both reside in the same world. To my knowledge, this is my first time reading a series of books that takes place in the same world but are written by two different authors. So right off the bat in opening the book, I'm going to say I'm pleased with what I see. We are given two maps one of Malaz Isle, and one of Malaz City, which is where our story takes place. You may not care about this, but for me this is great. I love opening the book and seeing the area where our story will be focused. The prologue tells us exactly where we are, and where it relates to Malaz Isle. You can immediately go looking for it on the map and find it. From there we get something I've never seen before. So, we have our prologue, followed by what I guess is an interlude? It has no name, simply a title which is A Path Within Shadow, and once that's done, we're then hit with the appropriately titled Chapter 1. This isn't a big deal, but I'm still confused. If you aren't aware, I am a fan of structure and consider common book templates a positive trait. Not that I'll ignore a book that does something unique, but in this case it almost seems like an oversight. Is this supposed to be part of the prologue, but just separate from the previous prologue section? I honestly don't know, and the fact that I don't know what it is bothers me. But anyway, so we reach chapter 1, and we see the same flaw that I have with Erickson. This entire book has only 6 chapters, meaning each chapter is roughly 76 pages long. Why? Who does this help? Also, my copy of the book is 456 pages long, and whoever templated the pages and bound the book was clearly trying to make the book longer than it needed to be. I've never seen so much wasted space per page in a book in my life. According to Wikipedia, Night of Knives is extremely short compared to the subsequent novels, so I can only assume I have a later printing where the publisher was attempting to keep each novel roughly the same dimensions and as such chose to template in a way that drastically increased the page count. Going off the page count from Wikipedia, it should only be 304 pages long, so I assume this is correct. If you're coming into this book after the Book of the Fallen, be prepared because this book is much shorter, has a much smaller scope, and overall is much more focused. We follow two characters, Temper, who we saw a bit in the Book of the Fallen, but not enough to get a sense for the character as a whole, and a brand new character, Kiska. Temper is hiding among the Malazan garrison, trying to live out his days as an old man after holding a prestigious role in the Malazan army earlier in his career. Kiska, meanwhile, is a jumpstart young woman eager to leave boring old Malaz city behind and wants to join up with the Malazan military in order to see the world and accomplish great deeds. They end up being caught out at night during a shadow moon and must survive amidst warring cults, ascended beings, and mystical entities. The character jumping in this book is a common occurrence for books that follow multiple characters, but it's not detrimental to the overall story. The only oddity is that both characters are running around in the same areas repeatedly, but never once directly interact with one another. We need both characters because it provides the reader important background information and allows us to fully grasp the motivations of all parties involved in the Shadow Moon, but it's still so odd to read a story with two protagonists, both in the exact same city, very close in location passing by, but they don't even say two words to each other. The most we get is Kiska seeing Temper from afar and mistaking him for a revenant. That being said, I really like the way this first book was written. I like the smaller scope, it makes it easier to parse the information provided, and while there are some things which may confuse the reader, such as who are the Storm Riders, why did they come, what are their goals, it's not even close to as bad as it was with, say, Gardens of the Moon. You will walk away from this book feeling that you have a sense of what happened and what's going on in the world. One of the best things in my mind with this book that I appreciate that wasn't done with the Book of the Fallen was the introduction of flashbacks. Temper is a character who has been around for a long time. He was part of the Malazan army back when they were conquering the world in Seven Cities. But rather than what we find in Erickson's books, where the characters will vaguely mention or reminisce about a particular campaign or event long past, leaving it to the reader to piece it all together over the course of multiple books, here we get a full flashback. We see what Temper saw, see the betrayals and events that occurred firsthand, and I'll openly admit I like it better. I want to know about the characters we'll be following in this series, and Esselmont provides an easy way to learn about and understand a character's motivations. 
It makes it very easy to care about their struggles and what they're going through. They may not come across as being as complex as Ariston's characters, but that's okay. They don't need to be. One thing that I do find hilarious is that Esselmont provides a single line that spoils the entire motivation for the Book of the Fallen, but a reader who hasn't read Erickson's work will never know it. I appreciate that Esselmont will spell it out in black and white for the reader, whereas that's not something Erickson will do. Now I will say this. I've only read the one Esselmont book so far, and while I do like the approach that he has taken towards writing, I will also say that his writing style is worse than Erickson's. Even if I absolutely hated the way Erickson writes, which I don't, I would still say that on the whole Erickson's writing is better. But you'll also recall if you watch my Gripes video that I said if you have the choice make your writing neutral. And that's what Esselmont has done. It's functional and utilitarian and where a lot of people have given up on reading Erickson, I don't think they'd have a problem with Esselmont. I am going to get into book Gripes here though, because of course I am. What kind of person would I be if I didn't share my Gripes? So the easy stuff first. I found a few more spelling and grammar errors than I was expecting to see. I think I ended up coming across three in as many pages at one point. Aside from that, I did come across one egregious error. At one point he uses the wrong two, and that blew me away. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Spell check will not catch every error. In my mind, the worst errors to come across are two, two, and two, there, there, and there, and your, and your. There's no reason for this. I will say I don't blame Esselmont for this, though. His responsibility is writing the story. His editors and proofreaders, however, they exist to catch exactly this. The fact that this was missed is insane. I've never come across a book that had one of those errors in it, though I'm sure some exist. This is your professionally published book. Getting that mistake printed is unconscionable. The next thing I want to mention is that he has fits of writing where he will go on and on with description. There should never be a point in time where I have to read a page and a half of pure description. It's boring, and odds are good that whoever is reading will just start having their eyes glaze over. Using too much description is a crutch that is present in a lot of mediocre writing. So many Warhammer 40k authors feel the need to describe everything, and if I need to read one more passage of them describing the architecture of a ship, I'm going to gouge my eyes out. I had the same problem when I tried to read The Hobbit years ago. I got to the Enchanted Forest and it's something like 20 pages of pure description. I couldn't handle it, but I refused to skip parts of books, so I just put it down and never finished it. Here, Esselmont mostly uses it when he's describing moving through the city and so much is unnecessary. Most of these passages occur in fog with our protagonist moving through a shifting cityscape, so hearing about the street cobbles, or the tiling on the roofs, or the twisting road where it should be straight and which building or shop should be on my left but isn't gets tedious very quickly. There's no reason these sections couldn't be trimmed down and made more concise. It's a simple concept to grasp, and honestly I don't think anyone will be visualizing your city in excruciating and minute detail. As I've stated, this book is really short, and I almost feel like Esselmont went back through in an editing pass and added more pages of description just to increase the page length and hit that 300 page, 100,000 word checkpoint. On the whole, I enjoyed the book quite a bit, and will read the subsequent ones as soon as I can pick them up in store. I will say this book is short, sweet, and to the point. It's a single event taking place over a single night, and what you see is what you get. While it does hint at things taking place in the larger Malazan world, and if you've read the Book of the Fall and you'll recognize them, I don't feel like a brand new reader will be terribly lost. While there are some sprinklings of larger events throughout, I believe they are not the focus but rather an introduction of things to come in later novels. I may turn out to be wrong on that front, but for Knight of Knives, while it may be a simpler book, it took me less than a week of occasional reading to get through, I do think it gives a strong showing and holds up as a standalone book. Events are set in motion, events are resolved, and there are just enough hints and mysteries that make you want to pick up the next book to see where they may lead. But even if you don't enjoy the story that was written, at the very least you can walk away from the series feeling like you've read a complete story, and there's something to be said for that. But that's all from me. Thanks for watching, and have a good day.